Um, so thanks again, everyone, for being here today. My name is Etta King. I'm the Education Program Manager here at the Jewish Women's Archive. Um, for those of you that are less familiar with JWA, we'll talk a little bit more about our work in a second, but in short, we're um, an organization that lives on the web at jwa.org. And um, we're really about sharing stories and um, making known the accomplishments of American Jewish women. I'm joined today by Miriam Cantorstone, who's the Education Assistant. She's going to be driving us today, and um, we're going to get started. So use the chat um, or your microphone or raising your hand to, um, to get, uh, to chime in. yeah, to chime in whenever you need. Thank you, Miriam. <laughs> There's a lot going on on the panel here for us to pay attention to, so sometimes I get distracted by that. So, um, JWA is a nonprofit organization that our mission is to document Jewish women's stories, elevate their voices, and inspire them to be agents of change. So in that, you teachers, uh, Jewish educators out there across the country and really around the world are our fundamental partners. You're the people who are out there in the trenches doing this work and figuring out how do we reach kids, how do we reach learners of all ages, how do we make Judaism feel meaningful and relevant and something that people want to connect to. Um, and in that way, you're really catalysts for changing the narrative, making a narrative that's inclusive, that includes men's and women's stories, that includes voices that have sometimes been marginalized within the Jewish community. Um, and our job in that is really to support you as much as possible in doing that work. And as we are supporting you, you're helping us learn, we're helping you learn, and we're doing this work together, hopefully we'll be able to inspire our students and the people that we work with in our communities to create change and to think really critically from a Jewish lens about the impact that they want to have on the world and think about who they are and, and who they want to be and, and what they want to do from a Jewish perspective. Um, we have a few different goals for this program specifically. Uh, we want all of our online learning programs to be really practical. So this is something that we're hoping you can turn around and use next week, next month in um, your community, in your classroom, um, in your summer camps. And um, to that end, after this program, probably tomorrow or later this afternoon, we'll be making the recording and all of the materials, the handouts, the PowerPoint presentation um, from this available to you. So keep your eyes on your email for that, because that's how we'll connect you to those resources. Um, Sorry, can you oh, go back? Sorry, of course. That's okay. Um, these are also opportunities for you to explore new resources that are hopefully going to be compelling not only to your students, but also to you. This is a chance for you to learn a little bit, to explore new ideas, and maybe start to look at some of the stuff that um, you're teaching with a more critical perspective. And especially thinking about, you know, how are you including women's voices when we're talking about Jewish history, Jewish culture, Jewish values? How can we um, sort of move that conversation into something that feels inclusive, that feels like it's encapsulating more of the Jewish community? Um, so yeah, and I see Michal is writing in about contact list of participants. Yeah, we'll make sure that we get some sort of crowdsourced contact list going. Um, and at the end of this, we'll also put a link into the Jewish Educators National Educators Network, which is a Facebook group that we have, and I encourage all of you to join it. It's a great place to sort of share ideas. Um, so today we're going to be talking about Hanukkah. Hanukkah is coming up in a few weeks, and I'm really approaching it from this perspective after having talked to 10 or 20 teachers in preparation for this webinar as thinking about Hanukkah as a holiday of heroes. Um, so, and there are a few different reasons that we celebrate Hanukkah. So, we celebrate Hanukkah to commemorate this miracle of the oil lasting eight days. Um, we celebrate a military victory and the triumph of the Maccabees. Um, and we also are celebrating sort of religious continuity, that Judaism continued, um, Jews didn't assimilate, and that this culture is um, still something vibrant and worth fighting for. And those are all pretty common themes when we're teaching about Hanukkah. Um, is there anything... Do you, is there anything that I didn't capture sort of in that arc? I'm just waiting. There, see, you can see there are a couple people typing in. So 
um, if there's anything else that you talk about in your classroom or in your community, that would be great to know about. Yes, you will be getting all of the slides and materials from this program. Okay, so Hannah's writing in, talking about increasing joy in the winter months, talking about light. Yeah, that's another big theme. Thank you. A few other people. Our holiday of light and darkness. Yeah, so drawing from that and maybe some parallels there also to, to strength, courage, um, maybe this idea of being a light unto the nations. Those are other things that I've heard people talk about at this time. Currently, we speak about different narratives, decolonization. Yeah, so these are these are all different themes, and I'm actually really interested in hearing more about how you all approach this, and so hopefully um, we'll continue the conversation that we're having today on the Facebook group um, after this, and I'd love to have hear from you all and have you post if you have lesson plans or even like a paragraph that sort of just talks about what you do. So I, I know also that there are like, um, there's no one way that everyone teaches about Hanukkah, but there are definitely some major commonalities. And today we're going to think about what more we can learn. And some of you in your suggestions have talked about this a little bit more. Um, but first of all, how can we go beyond what, um, what we are learning and what we are already teaching, go beyond celebrating, go beyond the story that we, we always tell and go a little bit deeper. But this is actually an opportunity to think about what it means to be heroic. What does it mean to stand up for something that you believe is right? And to think critically about that idea and ask our students to draw some parallels to their own lives, thinking about how they can think critically about their own identities. And holidays, especially one as popular as Hanukkah, are a great entry point to doing that. So what we're going to do today is model a few different activities and also share some stories with you that you can then take offline and use and adapt in your classroom. So I also want to emphasize that what we're offering to you today is some support and some new ideas. And we know that being talented educators, you're going to take and do what's best for your students. So don't feel like you have to take and teach what we're giving you the exact same way that we would do it. Make it work for you. But what we want to do is offer you something new and something different that can um, be exciting for you and for your students. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do an activity using a web tool called the Lino Board. Um, and this activity is um, I think that the line of word is usually not accessible to people who are on um, from an, coming in from an iPad. So if you're having trouble posting to the Lino board or seeing the Lino board, I'm going to share my screen so that you can see it. And you can also um, type into the chat your answers if you can't get to the Lino board. So in the chat, I've posted a link to the Lino board. And um, go ahead and open that. It's going to open in another browser window in whatever browser you're using, Safari or Chrome or whatever. And what I would like you to do is take a look at the prompts that are written here. And we're responding to the question of what makes somebody a hero. And so what I'd like you to do is post at least one thing in each category, something that they are, something that somebody is, like, for example, courageous, and something that somebody does that makes them a hero, um, and sort of put it in these two categories. And we, um, we're going to sort of crowdsource a definition of what it means to be a hero or, or what a hero is. So I'm going to stop talking and give you all a minute to do that. And as you're doing that, I'll sort of don't worry so much about where your sticky note falls. I'll sort them into the categories that they are being sorted into. Does that make sense? Kind of. So, and this is a virtual way to do this. It, if you are in a setting where you have kids who have access to tablets or access to computers, you could just as easily do this online. Um, you can also do this offline with butcher paper on a whiteboard. Um, I know you all have many creative ideas for, um, for doing this kind of activity. Yeah, so a lot of good suggestions coming in. Keep them coming. We're going to 
we're going to keep going here. Yeah, click refresh. Yeah, so if you're having trouble seeing the new um, sticky notes as they're coming up, go ahead and click refresh. And um, it'll show you the new sticky notes that have been posted. So a lot of things here. Um, great. And I'm going to try to start to pull out some, some common themes here. So um, heroes take risks or chances. They inspire and help others. Um, woo! They make a difference in the world. So something there's something there about impact. Um, there are also some really great adjectives that we have on the something that they are um, side. Tenacious, driven, having inner strength. A clarity of vision, I really like that. Um, they stand up for what they believe in. Um, I like this one, doing something that needs to be done to better society. So there's something here about um, having a broader vision, a vision of others, a vision of sort of the big picture, the grand narrative. Great. Um, they communicate well and authentically. They work hard and are dedicated to that work. Um, yeah, there's a lot here about inspiration and, and compassion. So I like this also, smart and intuitive, but not always brave. There is some question about um, brave being something that we is some is something is brave something that you call yourself or something that other people call you because what you have because of what you've done which I think is an important question. So as we're looking at this, I'm going to keep um, organizing this, and we've got a million things on this board, which is totally great. Um, and so in uh, in an effort to sort of model, as you're doing this with your students, you'll want to put this stuff out and help them draw connections between the suggestions that they're making. Sometimes it's helpful to give examples. So when we say, oh, this person is selfless, what do you, what does that mean? You know, say more about what it means to be selfless or um, forthright. Some, sometimes people will offer something that doesn't, uh, isn't like immediately clear. Um, and also to draw out the commonalities sort of saying like, is there anything that we could say generally is like pretty archetypal or generally accepted as, um, as being heroic? And I think it's important to have a definition for starting the rest of the conversation. Um, so now we're going to go back to the PowerPoint. So, and we will send you the link to the Lino board so you'll have access to that um, after the email. So go ahead and find your way back to the PowerPoint. And I want to just turn to you all for a minute and ask um, why heroes, if you think heroes are important, and why. And also a question about um, whether or not you teach your students about heroes and why you do that. So feel free to type in or unmute your microphone and speak up um, and share with us sort of your take on these two questions. So I see there are a couple people writing in. Okay, so Lisa Cohen is writing in, um, oh, saying you can't hear. Um, great. Um, so does anyone have a response to these questions of why heroes are important? I see that there are lots of people typing in, so we'd love to hear your thoughts. 
Okay, so Valerie's saying heroes and their narratives are learning opportunities. Yeah, so a chance for us to learn from the examples of others. Absolutely. So I guess that that goes in the why they're important category. So Michal is saying, because they provide an opportunity to scale what we value and what we don't in people. Right, so talking about heroes, talking about what are their, the qualities in them that we admire um, and sort of qualifying them in that way helps us then say, who are other people that we know or in our community or in our society who have these qualities? Um, Toby saying it shows Jewish values in action. Yep, so concrete, cr concrete examples of different Jewish values that we're talking about. Um, providing opportunities, oh sorry, stories um, to help teach behaviors and ideals, absolutely. Um, Simone is saying that um, at Nishma in St. Louis, they celebrate Chag Habanot for mothers and daughters on the seventh night of Hanukkah to recognize female heroes. And Marilyn is sort of adding to that saying, non-stereotypically, heroes who are non-stereotypical gives our students a chance to see themselves potentially as heroes and also to think, think sort of outside this vision of somebody who is grand and brave um, that also there are everyday heroes, absolutely. Um, Yoni is saying that sometimes we ignore their flaws in an attempt to think of them as great and he wants his students to um, understand that nuance and sometimes that's lost with big heroes. I think that's certainly true. So sometimes diving a little bit more critically into those stories and thinking about like what are the things that we admire but also what are the things that maybe aren't so great from this person's experience. Um, so Michal is asking a question about um, whether heroes are always in historical and sociological contexts um, or if heroes are sort of timeless thinking about, you know, I think that calls into question thinking about contemporary heroes, famous heroes, non-famous heroes, um, and also helping kids understand that um, the, they have power alone and power in community. Kate is saying, um, <laughs> help imagine themselves in a new light, no pun intended. I appreciate the pun. Um, but yeah, there's definitely something that we'll be talking about a little bit later about what it means to stand up for something alone and what it means to do that with others and that both of those things are heroic and also that um, the person leading the stand is as much of a hero as the person who's participating in the stand and thinking about that. Um, great. So um, now what we're going to do is we're going to go on to talking about a new hero who some of you may teach about but I think commonly is left out of the story and it's a story of a hero who we, uh, who has traditionally and historically, her story has been invoked at this time of year during the celebration of Hanukkah, and that's um, the biblical Judith. So the first thing that I wanna do is take a quick poll from you all and just find out how much you know about Judith and um, whether or not you already teach about her. So I'm gonna go ahead and open these two polls and just take a minute to, um, to take the poll and view the results to see, see sort of where you stand in relation to everybody else. <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna be getting to the story of Judith in a minute. So it seems like there's a pretty even split between people who have heard about her um, or who don't know anything about her, and people who know a little bit more or a little bit less, um, and that most people don't teach about her, which I think is really interesting for uh, many reasons. Also, Judith is my Hebrew name, Yehudit, and so I have a particular fondness for her story and her character. Okay, so it looks like these are slowing down. I'm going to close these polls so that we can see the screen. Um, and... Uh, we're going to get going here, and I'm just going to, if you'll humor me for a few minutes, 
I'm just going to tell you uh, one version of the story of Judith. So most of us are familiar with the story of Hanukkah. Um, we've talked about it already a little bit. Around 165 BCE, in the land of Judea, a great miracle happened, and that's what we celebrate. After being conquered by several different powerful rulers, including Alexander the Great, the land of Judea and all of its inhabitants was taken and controlled by a king called Antiochus IV, or also Antiochus Epiphanes. Unlike previous rulers who were known for supporting religious tolerance and cultural freedom, Antiochus and his supporters outlawed Judaism and repressed Jewish practice often with violence. Um, unsurprisingly, this led to large-scale revolt by the Maccabees, led by a Jewish priest and his sons. And after many struggles and battles, this is the story we all know, the Jews won back their religious freedom and rededicated the temple. There was only enough oil to light the menorah for one day, but instead, miraculously, it lasted for eight. And this is what we celebrate when we light the Hanukkah. But there is another story that Jews tell on Hanukkah, some Jews. It's the story of a Jewish widow named Judith and how her courage helped to free the Jewish people from religious persecution and probably, quite possibly, death. Um, in rabbinic times, her story was told on Hanukkah. This is a well-documented um, tradition. And uh, somehow over the years, that story has been lost. We can talk about that a little bit more. Um, and, but in fact, Ju the Judith story isn't included in the Tanakh, which is sort of the codified source of Jewish text. So well, many of the codified texts in the Christian tradition include her story in their copies of the Old Testament, her Judah story is found in the Apocrypha. It's not in the codified text of our tradition. Um, so her story goes like this. Most historians agree that the story of Judith actually took place a few hundred years before the story of the Maccabees um, in a town called Bethulia, which was located in Judea, very, in the very south. Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of the Babylonian Empire, sent one of his generals to conquer, um, named Holofernes to conquer Judea, and um, all of the Jews who lived there. During this campaign, he camped outside of Bethulia with thousands of troops blocking off water, food, and other supplies from the city. And though the Jews fought back at first, they quickly um, became desperate. Their situation was very dire. And um, Judith, can you just go back? Yeah. yeah. So Judith, this widow, stepped in and said, you know what, I have a plan. Um, so don't give in yet, don't surrender, I have a plan, and um, just let me try this. Under the cover of night, Judith and her handmaid snuck out of Bethulia and into Holofernes' camp, pretending to surrender. The general was smitten by her, by her beauty and her grace, and he took her to his tent, where she offered him some cheese and some wine, lots of wine. Holofernes fell into a deep sleep, you can imagine why, and when he was finally out cold, Judith took his sword and chopped off his head. Um, and this is a very popular scene. If you Google Judith, um, you'll just find hundreds of paintings and sculptures that depict this scene. Judith and her handmaid snuck out of the camp, taking Holofernes' head back with them to Bethulia. The Jews were emboldened by the women's bravery. Meanwhile, the enemy camp fell into complete chaos and panic, which created an opening for the Jews to launch a counterattack, which they won, and the Assyrian forces uh, fell back. Though her story most likely took place at a different time in history than the Maccabean Revolt, there are obvious parallels between the Judith story and the story of the Maccabees. So one is sort of this story of military victory, um, following a very familiar narrative of sort of the small conquering the mighty, right? This is one woman and her handmaiden um, conquering an entire army with the help of her people who are this small community or village. Um, and also there's um, the parallel between Judah Maccabee, the name Yehuda, and the name Yehudit, Judith. It's the male and female versions of that name. Um, and there's also something to be said here about um, the strength of community, and particularly looking at the story of Judith, looking at her as someone who didn't actually act alone. She took her handmaid with her, somebody who could provide strength, helped her strategize, and helped her, you know, carry, do, commit the act and carry the head with her back to the Thulia. Um, so it's, it's interesting, 
actually also that early rabbinic texts well document the recitation of the Judith story and also a tradition of eating dairy on Hanukkah. Um, in fact, it's probably true that the first latkes were actually made of fried cheese rather than fried potatoes because potatoes are sort of a newer um, vegetable. And so um, there's this there's this tradition and some food historians say that the first latkes were probably made of cheese, um, remembering that Judith fed cheese to Holofernes, salty cheese, so that he would become thirsty and he would drink the wine so that she could kill him. Um, yeah, delicious. <laughs> so that's for those of you out there who like to do um, cooking and connect food to holidays. This is sort of a new twist. So um, knowing this story, knowing about this tradition of eating dairy, and knowing that there are some communities that tell this story, but you know, three quarters of you don't, it really makes you wonder why. Why don't we tell this story? And also, what other stories don't we know and are we not sharing with our students? So I just want to take a few minutes to discuss um, whether or not you all think Judith is a hero. Um, and actually, we're going to put all the questions up and let you guys sort of jump in um, and let us know sort of, do you think she's a hero? And why do you think she's so often left out? So feel free to jump in using the chat to see if you people are writing in. Um, teaching on the computer in this setting is a really good reminder of practicing that like silence is very generative. So when it's quiet, all of you all are thinking and typing in your responses. So we are eager to read what you have to say. Also, if any of you prefer not to type and would rather speak up, you can just turn your microphone on. Okay, so Michal is raising some um, the point that Judith's story brings up issues of recognizing the different sources that we draw our stories from, and that um, Judith is a byproduct of this bigger question of what goes in in the canon, what sort of counts or what's in the must-have of Jewish teaching and Jewish text, and what isn't. Um, Toby says we that you've talked about her with your seventh grade students. Um, wonder if a question would be what did she think of or try first before the violent step? So that's an interesting discussion question to bring in if you choose to teach about her is um, what are the other options? Why did she feel like those other options weren't a bit available to her? Maybe an opportunity to create some midrash about other things that she had tried. Um, and Ellie's saying, yeah, I think it's left out because of the violence. Um, elements that are left out of the traditional Hanukkah story of the Purim story. So we do, we tend to whitewash that a little bit for our students. And I think given our earlier discussion about heroism, about making different difficult choices, and also about creating something that feels real to our students, there's a question of like, what does it mean when we're leaving out those part of the stories? And obviously, if you're working with really young kids, um, you might not want to share or especially show pictures of very violent acts, but thinking about like, what does that mean? I think in approaching that from a critical lens of, of what does it mean for us to choose not to share those stories? Um, lots of people are writing in. I will make sure that you all get the chat log, so I'm sorry if I miss some of what you say. Um, but a few people are writing in saying, yeah, they would have to make sure that it was age appropriate, but they'd love to share this with their students. Um, yeah, Marilyn is saying that perhaps the reason the Maccabees, the story of the Maccabees is more prevalent is because Judith is a woman. She's also somewhat controversial in the fact that she is essentially seducing Holofernes. So there's certainly a question of like where sexuality comes into this. That's not something that everybody feels like they can tackle. Um, and again, questions about whether or not you can leave that out and how you best do that. 
Um, yeah, Lee, so Lisa is talking about um, being afraid of warlike implications in Hanukkah, especially living in the diaspora. Um, yeah, absolutely. And having these holidays be about honoring heroes rather than about military victory, thinking about that a little bit more critically. Um, and also, I think, you know, thinking about uh, that ties in a little bit to the narrative that we often draw, especially in the United States, about assimilation, right? And this is a story where Jews didn't assimilate and we're continuing that tradition. And well, that's definitely true and definitely a theme of this story, there's a little bit more there. Um, Ilana's writing in saying she's a hero in terms of being brave and saving when the men of her town were afraid. But like so many ancient women, she had to use deception in order to accomplish her end. Yeah, so there's certainly a conversation perhaps to be had here about tactics and um, and things like that. And a few people raising the point that violence and sexuality come up in a lot of stories and we deal with them in different ways. So I think our challenge to you, and it sounds like the challenge that some of you are posing to each other is, is there a way to bring this story in? How would you do that? And um, and and just being aware of the implications of um, choosing what stories we choose to tell and how we choose to tell them, that that really has a lot of, those are a lot of big questions that we face as educators. So one, we're going to move on now. This is a great conversation. Um, and we're going to move on because I want to make sure that we get to another part, which is our model for doing education at the Jewish Women's Archive is really about personal narrative and the experiences and stories of people and helping our students relate to those stories. And so sometimes I think the Judith story is a perfect example of this that feels so far away. Like it's an army camp in the middle of Judea, there's swords and like, this is a crazy story that feels, I think in some ways pretty distant. So one of the things that we do here and that we recommend educators do is help bring that story by continuing that narrative and drawing that legacy forward. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna, um, let's go back. Sorry. Yeah. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to break out into two groups. So um, Miriam is going to go to lead another breakout group in the other room. You get to stay exactly where you are. <laughs> and um, what we're going to do is we're going to break out into two groups. And Miriam's going to lead one discussion. And I'm going to lead the other discussion. And you're going to have a short amount of time, about 15 minutes or so. I'll give you five-minute warning okay. um, to learn about... Um, a, a more modern historical example of a woman hero. And as you're talking about her and learning about her, you're going to read some text about her, and then you're going to talk with each other about whether or not you think she's heroic and what connections there are. And this is the part where you get to sort of think a little bit creatively about how you might bring these stories into your classrooms. So I'm going to split everybody equally into two groups, and I will see all of you back here in 15 minutes. Thank you guys for um, doing that document study. I know that not everyone got to look at both of the people. So you did look at two different examples of uh, more contemporary heroes. And we're going to send you the document studies for both of those. So you'll get a chance to look at the person that the other group um, learned about and share both of them with your students if you'd like to do that. Um, so we're, we're wrapping up here. And I want to... I want to open the floor for a few questions and more discussion if we have it. But before that, I just want to um, leave you with a couple thoughts. So um, Hanukkah, looking back at um, the fact that we're really talking about Hanukkah and how to celebrate Hanukkah, I think it, this is a relevant point in the conversation to bring up the fact that Hanukkah means dedication. That's the translation of the word. And so when we're talking about Jewish values, why people choose. In our group, we talked a lot about what makes a hero is that somebody chooses to act, chooses to do something, even if there's risk involved. Um, and so I think asking some questions about um, 
dedication and what students are dedicated to is a good way to bring that back to them. So another huge part of our focus at JWA is about building Jewish identity and helping our students sort of confront these questions. So if you look at this diagram, the red arrow is looking at these biblical and historical figures and the yellow arrow is looking at myself as a learner and or our class together in our learning process. And thinking about where these two arrows intersect, I think is the place where really deep, important, meaningful learning happens. Um, Michal is saying, um, not just why do I do something, but also why don't I do something? And that's a, a theme that's come up a few times in our conversation today, thinking about um, why people make some choices and not others. There was a question about, um, does it, does taking, is taking a stand heroic? Can it be heroic to not take a stand, but instead to just choose not to do something? Um, and so I think a good way to sort of conclude a lesson talking about um, heroism and Hanukkah and looking at these different stories is to think, ask your students to reflect a little bit about um, what they feel dedicated to. Is there a particular community to which they feel dedicated, um, a value, an idea? Um, and perhaps this is an opportunity to connect further to lessons that you're doing in the future, things about social justice activism, if you're doing a tikkun olam project, if there's a particular subject that um, your students are interested in or passionate about, thinking as an educator how you can capitalize on that. And I think building in some of these reflective questions where we're saying, okay, we learned about Judith. We talked about whether or not she was a hero and why her story is kind of complicated. Like why, for example, is making change violently, is that good or bad? And we talked about that. And then we looked at these two examples of um, historical women and the ways that they made change and the risks that they took. And are there times in our lives where we've done those things or seen other people do them? And then thinking about you know, what does all of this mean for me? Here is this incredibly rich legacy within Judaism of people taking a stand, and not just in one way, but in different ways. Um, and where does my story fit in that legacy? Um, so what I'd like to do now, I see that people have been typing into the chat, so we'll recap a little bit there. Um, but I'd also love to just hear if anyone has um, questions about this, reflections on um, what we talked about, or um, questions or ideas for how you might bring some of this into your classroom this year. So a few people saying this is a great opportunity for civics education, totally. Um, and talking about that like in an American context and also in a Jewish context. Looking at it, um, civics within the United States, but also like within our congregation or our school or our community. What, what are the norms? What are we doing to support each other? Um, connecting it to service learning also, that seems a pretty clear distinction. We have a couple different ways to move forward with that, especially if you think about whether you're using heroes that we suggest, other heroes from JWA.org, or just heroes that you know of, there's a way to sort of connect thematically to different kinds of uh, tikkun olam, if you're interested in environmentalism, you can bring in someone who is an environmentalist, labor issues, civil rights issues, all that kind of stuff. Um, Michal is saying this is also a chance um, for root study of war generations and involvements. Yeah, um, all this is great, current parental involvement in Jewish humanitarian activity. Yeah, this is also a great time to invite community guest speakers. If someone in your community um, is an activist or has participated in different sort of activist or humanitarian work, this is a great opportunity to reach out uh, to those people and sort of bring a living text into your classroom. Um, and Marilyn's saying, you know, the, a big question here is what does it mean to stand up for something you believe in? And I think asking students that question, like, it's sometimes even a little bit simplistic to say like, yeah, heroes are heroic because they stood up for what they believed in, but like, what does that even mean? Why, why, why is it that sometimes we choose not to do that? And, and coming to that sort of difficult place of like, why do we sometimes choose not to do that? Why are there some heroes who did things differently than we would have done them? Those sort of conflict or contradiction points are really useful for these moments of trying to figure out who I am as a student and what I'm taking from this. Um, yeah. 
And Yoni's saying that he, this would be a great connection to talking about um, community uh, training and community organizing and um, looking at different aspects of power, privilege, and self-interest. And we have some other great resources about power, privilege, and responsibility on our site. Does anyone else, we're three minutes um, till two o'clock and we try to be really conscious of the fact that your time is extremely valuable and we so appreciate that you spent an hour of that time with us. Um, does anyone else have questions or ideas that they wanna put out in to the group before we uh, head out here? I see a few people are typing, so I'll just wait before I totally wrap up. Great, so thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to put a pod out into the um, window here. And what you'll see is there are two links in this pod. One that says join the JWA National Educators Network on Facebook and one that's a program feedback survey. So basically you can click on those links and click browse to and it'll open a link to those pages in your browser. Um, I would love to have all of you join the Jewish Educators Network or the National Educators Network on Facebook. This is a place where we can really continue the conversation that we've been having here. We'll post some materials there. Um, it's also the place where we first announce new professional development opportunities, curricular resources, um, etc. So if you're on Facebook, that's a really great place for you to be. Feel free to join us there. And um, the other big thing is that this is, like I said, the first program in our online learning series this year. Um, this is a huge growth for us. From last year, we only did four webinars. So this year we're doing, um, I think, more than twice that many. And your feedback on how to improve is an essential part of making sure that we are maximizing this hour that we have together and really giving you all what you need. So please be sure to fill out that um, feedback survey and join the group, um, the Facebook group. And if for some reason the meeting ends before you've had a chance to do that or the links aren't working for you, we're going to send you a follow-up email um, either this afternoon or tomorrow and you'll get everything that you asked for. Um, I'm also putting my email address in the chat box now. And um, you are always welcome to email me. I'll also put my phone number um, in the chat box. You are welcome to email or call anytime if you're having trouble figuring out what resources to use in your community, you have a really great idea um, that you're teasing out. Um, so share that with me, share it on the Facebook group, and thanks again everyone for coming. I hope you have a wonderful Hanukkah, um, a happy Thanksgiving, a happy Thanksgivinga if you're celebrating that holiday this year. And um, in two weeks, we will be having another program like this, which will be about doing oral history and community history projects with our students. Um, and you'll have, there'll be more information about that. You can um, actually view our entire online learning calendar in this URL. Are you, mm -hmm. okay, I'm putting the URL in for our mm -hmm. online learning calendar. Um, so feel free to browse that. And um, thank you so much for coming.